Hello, my name is Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Car Suspension Over 120 Years of Ride and Handling. What I want to do in today's video is look at semi-trailing arm suspension used on a huge number of cars in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even in some cars into the 1990s. So let's take a look at it. Well, who used it? Well, BMW were the, the primary users of it. They popularized the suspension design, fitting it firstly in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, and then it went on to be used in all of their cars, three series, five series, six series, seven series, uh, very, very much uh, a user of semi-trailing rear arm suspension, but Mercedes also used it. A Nissan, Datsun used it on many of their cars. A Ford even used it, Rolls-Royce used it. So it was a very, very very popular suspension design at the back for over 30 years in rear wheel drive cars primarily. So let's take a look at what it comprised and how it actually came about. To start that process, I don't want to look at semi-trailing arms, I want to look at swing arms. Now, in this diagram, we're looking at the end view of the car, looking say at the back of the car. And we have here a lateral arm, a single lateral arm that goes to the center of the wheel. And on the inner part of the arm, there's a pivot. And so as the wheel goes over a bump, the swing arm swings. Obviously, that's what its name is, is derived from. And that's fine, except the camber of the wheel changes quite dramatically. The camber is the angle that the wheel makes to vertical. Now, if we used a really long lateral swing arm, and some cars did pivot right over the other side of the car, then we get reduced camber change, but most cars didn't do that. They pivoted at the midpoint of the car, and so we had a lot of camber change. Think, think Volkswagen Beetle, but also uh, think, you can think uh, of, of Auto Union races in the 1930s. They had a, a sort of swing arm suspension. So it's very simple. You have only one pivot, per arm, you don't have multiple pivot points, multiple ball joints or anything like that. But the trouble is you have a huge amount of camber change with suspension movement. And that degree of camber change isn't wanted. Hmm, okay. Well, that was with the pivot point in the middle of the car and the swing arm laterally. What if we move the pivot point right around? What if we move it to like this? Now, we're now looking down on the car from above. We've changed our perspective. And so here we have the arm that now moves forward. Here's the front of the car up the top of the picture. We have a pivot point there, and this wheel is being pulled uh, by the trailing arm over bumps and whatever else it meets. Now, when the wheel meets a bump, it just rises vertically. No camber change. And you might think, well, that's good, isn't it? He just said a moment ago, lots of camber change was terrible. Now we've got no camber change, so surely that should be optimal. Well, no because we want a little bit of negative camber in bump. Why? Because when the car rolls, when it's cornering, if we give that uh, outside loaded wheel a little bit of negative camber in bump, it actually will stand up more vertical. It makes up for the roll angle of the car, and so we get better grip. Now, plenty of cars have run trailing arms like this, Citroen, um, Austin, uh, lots of cars. Uh, but the problem is, a, it has a ground level roll center, which I'm not going to go into now, but the B, it doesn't change in camber. We want a little bit of camber change. All right, so if a swing arm, purely lateral arm, gave us an enormous amount of camber change, and a trailing arm, purely longitudinal arm, gave us no camber change, and we want a bit, what if we move the pivot point somewhere in between those two extremes? And as you will have guessed, that's what a semi-trailing arm does. So I've just kept it showing one arm. Normally it's a triangular assembly. And we're again looking down on it from above. Here's the pivot axis for the arm. And we can see it is no longer 90 degrees to the long axis of the car or parallel to the long axis of the car, but it forms an angle somewhere in between. And as you can see from this diagram, it's closer to a trailing arm than a swing arm in its design. So now we have some camber change, some negative camber change with bump which gives us that outside wheel standing more vertical than it otherwise would, and so giving us better grip. Okay, so that's a pretty advantageous thing to have, isn't it? Now, what do they look like in real world? Well, here's a BMW 733i. Now, if we were to draw a line from this point to this point, that would be exactly at 90 degrees to the long axis of the car. 
But if we actually show where the pivot points are for the trailing arm, we can see it's across that angle there. So it's not a pure trailing arm, or certainly no swing arm, is it? It's a semi-trailing arm. Now that semi-trailing angle becomes very important for something I'll talk about in a moment. And then we have the other one over there, BMW 733i. Or we can look at a Ford Sierra, a more recent car. If we drew a line from there to there, we can see that's the angle that the semi-trailing arm pivot points, the pivot axle is actually aligned on. And again, you can see it's quite different from going straight across the car. They're much more, as I said, a trailing arm than a swing arm in their design. Now, if we look at this diagram, we can immediately see some advantages. Look at how strong you can make that assembly, that triangular assembly. Two widely spaced pivot points gives it a lot of rigidity. Or if you choose to use different bush constructions, you can get that wheel to move backwards a fraction as it meets bumps and therefore have less harshness. There's plenty of room to put the spring in. There's plenty of room for the damper. It's an elegant, simple system that simply needs a joint at each of those uh, parts of the half shaft that uh, do the driving. And they also need to slide in and out a little bit. But again, that's all easily achievable. So it all starts to sound really, really good, doesn't it? It starts to sound like this would be an optimal suspension design even on cheap cars. Now the Datsun 510 of the late 1960s, known in some markets as the 1600, had semi-trailing arm rear suspension, very, very similar to the BMW 1600. But as the designer of this car told me when I was preparing the book, uh, his design was slightly more uh, advanced in many ways than the BMW suspension. Okay, now why aren't we then using it today? What, what are the negatives? Well, the amount of angle change that you get from those rear wheels, we've talked about camber change, but there's also a toe change, the direction the wheels are pointing in, depends on two, two fundamental things. It depends on the semi-trailing arm angle that we've talked about, how much it is a pure trailing arm versus how much it is a swing arm. But it also depends on the heights of the various things within the suspension. And so it depends on the inclination of the line that joins the pivot point that the swing arm swings on, that joins that pivot point to the hub. Okay, so you've got a few things you can change. You can change the semi-trailing arm angle within the design, but you can also change the relative heights of things, which causes other things to change. So you've got a few control mechanisms, but you're still always going to have change of camber and you're always going to have change of toe, the direction the wheels are pointing, during these suspension movements. Now, let's have a look at this diagram, because that puts a few of those ideas together. Here is the trailing arm length there, and here is the trailing arm angle. We can see this uh, doing what we described earlier. And so the effective swing arm length is where those two lines join. And you can see I talked about the fact that a swing arm could never be longer than the width of the car, but with a semi-trailing arm, you can make the effective length of the arm wider than the car is, which is why you don't get uh, so much camber change. And just briefly, and I'm not gonna go into detail in this video, you can also determine the height of the roll center by how high you make that point. So you also can control roll center height as well with this system. All right, so there's a quite a lot of information in there, isn't it? But in all cars with semi-trailing arms, you get negative camber in bump. The wheels go like that as you uh, load the car up or as the car undergoes bump. And here with the car off the ground, this five series, you can see you get positive camber in droop. So you're always going to get that uh, that amount of camber change. You, you can control how much you get, but you're always going to get camber change. And of course, if you think of an old BMW or an old uh, Datsun, heavily laden, four people and luggage, the back wheel's always like this. Now, you can overcome that by self-leveling rear suspension, but very few cars with semi-trailing arms progress to that, to that degree of sophistication. So let's have a look at a graph. What we have here is wheel travel on the vertical axis bump up here, rebound down there, or droop. And then we have camber change here, negative camber there, positive camber there. Remember, negative is when the uh, top parts of the wheels lean inwards more. Now, 
we've got two lines. We've got a line for a 20 degree semi-trailing arm angle and we've got a line for a 13 degree semi-trailing arm angle. Those, those pivot axes, the angles they make to the, to the longitudinal axis of the car. Now, don't worry about the fact that we've got two, but you can see that they give different camber curves, or in this case, not curves, straight lines. But in bump, irrespective of the angle of the trailing arms, you have got negative camber. And look, up to uh, here, 50 mils travel, 50 mils of uh, bump, you've got nearly four degrees of negative camber. You can typically see negative camber of half to one degree, four degrees is quite a lot. And then in rebound, uh, you can see it goes uh, at 50 mils, it goes into about uh, uh, one degree positive of camber. And you can see at no bump and no rebound, normal ride height, these cars are all set up to have negative camber, negative camber, static negative camber. But what I want you to look at is the fact that as the wheel goes through its travel, it's following a straight line in terms of camber change. There is quite a lot of camber change. Now, as I said, or touched upon earlier, toe changes as well. Now, now you've got two things happening simultaneously. You've got that camber change, but you also got toe change. And here's yet another semi-trailing arm suspension, Mercedes 350 SL. You can see uh, the, the, the angle there of the semi-trailing arms. And again, you can see what a neat assembly it is, how, how neat and how strong. So a final graph. What we've got is we've got the toe curves for the Nissan 300ZX, which replaced the 280ZX. And we can see that uh, while they've got differences, that the, the, um, the, the general idea is much the same, isn't it? So we've got toe in on the vertical axis here. We've got toe out down here. Toe in, the wheels are pointing inwards towards the center line of the car. We've got bump over here. We've got rebound over here. Now notice in bump, the wheels toe in. Now let's have a think about that for a moment. You're talking about the outside wheel when the car is rolling and cornering, the loaded wheel, we get negative camber on that loaded outside wheel and it points inwards a little bit. Now those two are actually both really good. The negative camber I've already explained, we've got more vertical to the road in terms of the tire angle and towing in gives the car a little bit more stability. If it were towing out, it would be trying to send the back of the car outwards into oversteer. And so while we've got two different uh, tow curves here for the two different cars, uh, they largely do much the same. They tow in on bump. And uh, the 280ZX tows in a bit also on rebound, whereas the 300ZX, 300ZX I'm sorry, tows a little bit out on rebound. Wow, all these things happening as these cars drive down the road with their rear wheels going up and down over bumps into holes and so on. So the huge advantages of semi-trailing arm rear suspension is firstly, it is independent. And remember back in the 60s when a lot of this was being introduced, most cars didn't have independent rear suspension. They had solid rear axles. And so if you can divorce the actions of the wheel so one does not affect the other, the whole system becomes much more stable. So semi-trailing arm rear suspension, low in cost, able to be tuned for differing camber and toe changes. And uh, subsequent models often did make changes to those tuning uh, aspects, as we saw a moment ago with both the BMW and the Nissan. The negative is it gives lift off oversteer. If you're cornering really hard and you back off sharply, the car will tend to want to oversteer. And uh, that's, that's typically regarded as a bit of a no-no these days. Back in the 60s, 70s and 80s, even without electronic stability control, um, driver's cars, if I can put it in that way, would often have a degree of oversteer built in. And the main reason we don't use anything like that today is it doesn't provide anywhere near the control of camber and toe angles as more modern multi-link suspensions do. I mean, the, the last of the semi-trailing arms, they started adding toe control links, but if you actually worked out the geometries, all the links were fighting each other. It was all a bit of a band-aid on top of a system that already had, had those changes occurring. And so if we want to have really precise control over camber and toe and dictate exactly the patterns of changes, then semi-trailing rear arms aren't sophisticated enough to do that. But look, I think uh, semi-trailing arm is one of my favourite suspensions. I've had lots of cars with it. Uh, I have a, uh, an old Mercedes in the family. It's uh, got uh, semi-trailing rear arm suspension with height control. 
So we don't get those big camber changes with load changes. And uh, my wife's car, which was another Mercedes, has got a very sophisticated multi-link rear suspension. I was driving in my wife's car yesterday and went over a bump and back, or back walked around. Nothing wrong with it, it's just how it is. Whereas the old Mercedes would have just sailed straight through. It wouldn't, wouldn't even have blinked over that bump. So again, as I reiterate uh, in these videos and often in my book, you know, th th there are huge changes that uh, purport to be marvelous advances. But when you actually drive the cars back to back, you know, there's not quite as much uh, advantage as, as you might think. Nothing like the, the huge improvements in safety or in fuel economy or anything like that. So semi-trailing arm rear suspension, uh, quite a marvelous suspension that was used on many, many millions of cars. It's all in the book, car suspension, over 120 years of ride and handling. Semi-trailing arms is one of the suspension designs that I cover in detail. The book's out now. It's available from Amazon in your country. Thank you.